Hello. All right. Um, I, I'm Christy Love. Hello. I'm going to read to you now the uh, awesome, awesome article by Andrew Sullivan called Why Obama's Critics Are So Dumb, uh, Why Liberal Voters Need to Grow Up, and How Obama's Long Game Will Outsmart His Critics. And it's by Andrew Sullivan. And then, if I don't have a lot of energy right now, please excuse me. I haven't had much sleep. <laughs> okay. All right. The right calls him a socialist. The left says he sucks up to Wall Street. And independents think he's a wimp. Well, I disagree with that. I'm an independent. I don't think that at all. Andrew Sullivan on how the president may just end up outsmarting them all. You hear it everywhere. Democrats are disappointed in the president. Independents have soured even more. Republicans have worked themselves up into an apocalyptic fervor. And yes, this is not exactly unusual. A president in the last year of his first term will always get attacked mercilessly by his partisan op opponents, and also often by the feistier members of his base. And when unemployment is at a remarkably high levels, and with the national debt setting records, the criticism will, and should be, even fiercer. But this time with this president, something different has happened. It's not that I don't understand the critiques of Barack Obama from the enraged right and the demoralized left. It's that I don't even recognize their description of Obama's first term in any way. The attacks from both the right and the left on the man and his policies aren't out of bounds. They're simply, empirically, I'm sorry, empirically wrong. A caveat. I write this as an unabashed supporter of Obama from early 2007 on. I did so not as a liberal, but as a conservative-minded independent appalled by the Bush administration's record of war, debt, spending, and torture. Agreed. Me too. I did not expect or want a messiah. Me too. I have one already, thank you very much. Me too. And there have been, his name is Jesus, and there have been many times when I have disagreed with the decisions Obama has made to drop the bowels Simpson debt commission to ignore the war crimes of the recent past and to launch a war in Libya without Congress's sanction to cite three. But given the enormity of what he inherited, and given what he explicitly promised, it reminds simply a fact that Obama has delivered in a way that the unhinged right and purist left have yet to understand or absorb or appreciate. Their short-term outbursts have missed Obama's long game, and why his re-election remains, in my view, as essential for this country's future as his original election in 2008. The right's core case is that Obama has governed as a radical leftist attempting a fundamental transformation of the American way of life. Mitt Romney accuses the president of making the recession worse, of wanting to turn America into a European welfare state, of not believing in opportunity or free enterprise, of having no understanding of the real economy, and of apologizing for America and appeasing our enemies. According to Romney, Obama is a mortal threat to the soul of America. This is coming from a guy who has no soul, but anyway. And an empty suit who couldn't run a business, let alone a country. <laughs> I got your empty suit, Romney. Um, anyway, leave aside the internal incoherence. How could such an incompetent be a threat to anyone? <laughs> None of this is even faintly connected to reality, and the rec record proves it. On the economy, the facts are these. When Obama took office, the United States of America was losing around 750,000 jobs a month. The last quarter of 2008 saw an annualized drop in growth approaching 9%. This was the most serious downturn since the 1930s. There was a real chance of a systemic collapse of the entire global financial system, and unemployment and debt lagging indicators were about to soar even further. No fair person can blame Obama for the wreckage of the next 12 months as the financial crisis cut a swath through employment. Economies take time to shift course. But Obama did several things at once. He continued the bank bailout begun by George W. Bush, he initiated a bailout of the auto industry, and he worked to pass a huge stimulus package of $787 billion. All these decisions deserve scrutiny, and in retrospect, they were far more successful than anyone has yet fully given Obama the credit for. The job collapse bottomed out at the beginning of 2010 as the stimulus took effect. Since then, the U.S. has added 2.4 million jobs. That's not enough, but it's far better than what Romney would have you believe, and more than the net jobs created under the entire Bush administration. In 2011 alone, 1.9 million private sector jobs were created, while a net 280,000 government jobs were lost. Overall, government employment has declined 2.6% over the past three years. That compares with a drop of 2.2% during the early years of the Reagan administration. 
To listen to current Republican rhetoric about Obama's big government socialist ways, you would imagine that the reverse was true. It isn't. The right claims the stimulus failed because it didn't bring unemployment down to 8% in its first year, as predicted by Obama's transition eco eco economic team. Instead, it peaked at 10.2%. But the 8% prediction was made before Obama took office and was wrong solely because it relied on statistics that guessed the economy was only shrinking by around 4%, not 9 Remove that statistical miscalculation made by government and private sector economists alike, and the stimulus did exactly what it was supposed to do. It put a bottom under the freefall. It is not an exaggeration to say it prevented a spiral downward that could have led to the Second Great Depression. You'd think, listening to the Republican debates, that Obama has raised taxes. Again, this is not true. Not only did he agree not to sunset the Bush tax cuts for his entire first term, he has aggressively lowered taxes on most Americans. A third of the stimulus was tax cuts, affecting 95% of taxpayers. He has cut the payroll tax and recently had to fight to keep it cut against Republican opposition. His spending record is also far better than his predecessors. Under Bush, new policies on taxes and spending cost the taxpayer a total of 5.07 oh, $5 trillion dollars. Under Obama's budgets, both past and projected, he will have added 1.4 trillion dollars in two terms. There's no comparison there. Under Bush and the GOP, non-defense discretionary spending grew by twice as much as under Obama. Again, imagine. Bush had been a Democrat and Obama a Republican. You could easily make the case that Obama has been far more fiscally conservative than his predecessor, except, of course, that Obama has had to govern under the worst recession since the 1930s, and Bush, after the 2001 downturn, governed in a period of moderate growth. It takes work to increase the debt in times of growth, as Bush did. It takes much more work to constrain the debt in the deep recession Bush bequeathed Obama. The great conservative bugaboo, Obamacare, is also far more moderate than its critics have claimed. The Congressional Budget Office has projected it will reduce the deficit, not increase it dramatically, as Bush's unfunded Medicare prescription drug benefit did. It is based on the individual mandate, an idea pioneered by the ARC Conservative Heritage Foundation, Newt Gingrich, and of course Mitt Romney in the past. It does not have a public option. It gives a huge new client base to the drug and insurance companies. Its health insurance exchanges were also pioneered by the right. It's to the right of the Clinton's monstrosity in 1993, and remarkably similar to Nixon's 1974 propo uh, proposal. Its passage did not preempt recovery efforts. It followed them. It needs improvement in many ways, but the administration is open to further reform and has agreed to allow states to experiment in different ways to achieve the same result. It is not, as Romney insists, a one-model top-down prescription. Like Obama's Race to the Top Education Initiative, it sets standards, grants incentives, and then allows individual states to experiment. Embedded in it are also a slew of cost reduction pilot schemes to slow health care spending. Yes, it crosses the Rubicon of universal access to private health care, but since federal law mandates that hospitals accept all emergency room cases requiring treatment anyway, we already obey that socialistic principle, but in the most inefficient way possible. Making 44 million current free riders pay into the system is not fiscally reckless. It is fiscally prudent. It is, dare I say it, conservative. On foreign policy, the right-wing critiques have been the most unhinged, Romney accuses the president of apologizing for America, and others all but accuse him of treason and appeasement. I got your treason, GOP. Mm -hmm. He ain't loyal to God or country. Anyway. <clears throat> Obama got Osama, that's all I have to say. Instead, okay, back to the article. Instead, Obama reversed Bush's policy of ignoring Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm, immediately setting a course that eventually led to his capture and death. And when the moment for a decision came, the president overruled both his secretary of state and vice president in order, in ordering the riskiest but most ambitious plan on the table. He even personally ordered the extra helicopters that saved the mission. It was a triumph, not only in killing America's primary global enemy, but in getting a massive trove of intelligence to undermine al-Qaeda even further. If George Bush had taken out bin Laden, wiped out al-Qaeda's leadership, and gathered a treasure trove of real intelligence by a daring raid, he'd be on Mount Rushmore by now. Ah, he would have been. 
Yeah, Obama needs to be on Mount Rushmore. He's a real hero right there. Hmm. Anyway, but where Bush talked tough and acted counterproductively, because he was high, Obama... Okay, that wasn't in the article. I said that. He was high, though. Anyway, Obama <laughs> simply, quietly, relentlessly decimated our real enemies while winning the broader propaganda war. Since he took office, Al-Qaeda's popularity in the Muslim world has plummeted. Obama's foreign policy, like Dwight Eisenhower's or George H.W. Bush's, eschews short-term political hits for long-term strategic advantage. It is forged by someone interested in advancing American interests, not asserting an, ideologi an ideology and enforcing it regardless of the consequences by force of arms. By hanging back a little by leading from behind in Libya and elsewhere, Obama has made other countries actively seek America's help and reappreciate our role. As an antidote to the bad feelings of the Iraq war, it has worked close to perfectly. But the right isn't alone in getting Obama wrong. While the left is less unhinged in its critique, it is just as likely to miss the screen for the pixels. From the start, liberals projected onto Obama absurd notions of what a president can actually do in a polarized country, where anything requires 60 Senate votes, even to stand a chance of making it into law. They have described him as a hapless tool of Wall Street, a continuation of Bush and civil liberties, a cloistered elitist unable to grasp the populist moment that is his historic opportunity. They rail against his attempts to reach a grand bargain on entitlement reform. They decry his too small stimulus, his too weak financial reform, and his too cautious approach to gay civil rights. They despair that he reacts to rabid Republican assault with lofty appeals to unity and compromise. They miss, it seems to me, two vital things. The first is the simple scale of what has been accomplished on issues liberals say they care about. A depression was averted. The bailout of the auto industry was amazingly successful. Even the bank bailouts have been repaid to a great extent by a recovering banking sector. The Iraq war, the issue that made Obama the nominee, has been ended on time and vitally with no troops left behind. Defense is being cut steadily even as Obama has moved his own party away from a Pelosi-style reflexive defense of all federal entitlements. Under Obama, support for marriage equality and marijuana legalization has crested to record levels. Under Obama, a crucial state, New York, made marriage equality for gays an, irre uh, an irreversible fact of American life. Gays now openly serve in the military and the Defense of Marriage Act is dying in the courts. Undefended by the Obama Justice Department. Vast government money has been poured into non-carbon energy investments via the stimulus. Fuel emission standards have been drastically increased, torture was ended, two moderately liberal women replaced men on the Supreme Court. Oh yes, and the liberal holy grail that eluded Johnson and Carter and Clinton nearly universal health care has been set into law. PolitiFact recently noted that of 508 specific promises, a third had been fulfilled and only two have not had some action taken on them. To have done all this whilst simultaneously battling an economic hurricane and a obstructionist Congress, you know, GOPers who won't do anything to help us because they just want to see him fail. This all makes Obama about as honest a fellow th follow-through artist as anyone can expect from a politician. I agree. What liberals have never understood about Obama is that he practices a show-don't-tell long game form of domestic poli politics. What matters to him is what he can get done, not what he can immediately take credit for. And so I railed against him for the better part of two years for dragging his feet on gay issues. But what he was doing was getting his Republican defense secretary and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to move before he did. The man who made the case for repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was, in the end, uh, Admiral Mike Mullen. This took time, as did his painstaking change in the rule barring HIV-positive immigrants and tourists. But the slow and deliberate and unprovocative unpro manner in which it was accomplished made the changes more durable. Now, for the first time, I realized that to understand Obama, you have to take the long view. Because he does. Or take the issue of the banks. Liberals have derided him as a captive of Wall Street, of being railroaded by Larry Summers and Tim Geithner, into a too passive response to the recklessness of the major U.S. banks. But it's worth recalling that at the start of 2009, any responsible president's priority would have been stabilization of the financial system, not the exacting of revenge. Obama was not elected, despite liberal fantasies, to be a left-wing crusader. <laughs> He's a moderate. Why didn't they? I, I, even, I knew that when I voted for him. But whatever. He was elected as a pragmatic, unifying reformist who would be more responsible than Bush. Exactly. Yeah, anyway, and what have we seen? 
a recurring pattern. To use the terms Obama first employed in his inaugural address, the president begins by extending a hand to his opponents. When they respond by raising a fist, he demonstrates that they are the source of the problem. Then finally, he moves to his preferred position of moderate liberalism and fights for it without being effectively tarred as an ideologue or a divider. This kind of strategy, strategy takes time, and it means there are long stretches when Obama seems incapable of defending himself or willing to let others to define him or simply weak. I remember those stretches during the campaign against Hillary Clinton. I also remember whose strategy won out in the end. <laughs> Obama. <laughs> this is where the left is truly deluded. By misunderstanding Obama's strategy and temperament and persistence, by grandstanding on one issue after another, by projecting an unrealistic fantasies onto a candidate who never pledged a liberal revolution, they have failed to notice that from the very beginning Obama was playing a long game. He did this with his own party over health care reform. He has done it with the Republicans over the debt. Excuse me. He has done it with the Israeli government over stopping the settlements on the West Bank and with the Iranian regime by not playing into their hands during the Green Revolution, even as they gunned innocents down in the streets. Nothing in his first term, including the complicated multi-year rollout of universal health care, can be understood if you do not realize that Obama was always planning for eight years, not four. Because <laughs> he's a champ. He's a champ, son. He knows what he's doing. Love it. And if he is reelected, he will have won a battle more important than 2008, for it will be a mandate for an eight-year shift away from the excesses of inequality, overreach abroad, and reckless deficit spending of the last three decades. It will recapitalize him to entrench what he has done already and make it irreversible. Yes, Obama has waged a war based on a reading of executive power that many civil libertarians, including myself, oppose. And he has signed into law the indefinite detention of U.S. citizens without trial, even as pledged never to invoke this tyrannical power himself. But he has done the most important thing of all, exercising, I guess he meant exercising, exercising the cancer of torture from military detention and military justice. E-X-C-I-S-I-N-G, I don't know what, exercising the cancer of torture from military detention and military justice. If he is not re-elected, that cancer may well return. Indeed, many of the right appear eager for it to return. Yeah, they're eager to get their money, you know, off, off of the, you know, steal it from middle class, hardworking people, the 99%. Anyway, sure, Obama cannot regain the extraordinary promise of 2008. We've already elected the nation's first black president and replaced a tongue-tied dolphin with a man of peerless eloquence. Not sure what that means. And he has certainly failed to end Washington's brutal ideological polarization as he pledged to do. But most Americans in polls rightly see him as less culpable for this impasse than the GOP. Obama has steadfastly refrained from waging the culture war while the right has accused him of a war against religion, which is bullcrap. He has offered to cut entitlements and has already cut Medicare, while the Republicans have refused to raise a single dollar of net revenue from anyone. Even the most austerity-driven government in, in Europe, the British Tories, are to the left of that. And it is the, this Republican intransigence from the 2009 declaration by Rush Limbaugh that he wants Obama to fail to the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's admission that his primary objective is denying Obama a second term. That has been truly responsible for the deadlock in Congress. And the only way out of that deadlock is an electoral route of the GOP, since the language of victory and defeat seems to be the only thing it understands. Meaning that vote for Obama is the only way to get them to do the right thing. If I sound biased, that's because I am. I'm biased towards the actual record, not the spin. Biased towards a president who has conducted himself with grace and calm under incredible pressure, who has had to manage crisis, not seen since the Second World War and the Depression, and who has, who as yet has not had a single significant scandal to his name. Thank you so much for that, Obama. I'm so sick of hearing all these scandals. Thank you for being loyal to your wife and not being crazy. You know, thank you for just being a good person. Good man. Thank you. Good father, good husband, all that good stuff. To see what it is, oh, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. George Orwell once wrote, clearly, we've got like the best president of our time and we don't, nobody seems, people don't seem to like realize that. What I see in front of my nose is a president whose character, record, and promise remain as grotesquely underappreciated now as they were absurdly hyped in 2008. 
<laughs> and I feel confident that sooner rather than later, the American people will come to see his first term from the same calm, sane perspective and decide to finish what they started. All right. That's it. Thank you for listening.